and welcome to Rogue Artisans and Crafters. We welcome you, our viewer, to a new series of episodes in 2018, where we feature local artists and craftspeople from within Southern Oregon. With our show, we talk to our featured artists about how they came to their art, what drives them as artists, find out stories behind their art and their art process, and how their work as artists influences their lives. Today, we have the privilege of featuring local artist Nancy Adams, who works as a clay artist and creates amazing, unique pottery pieces. I found Nancy and her work at the Clay Folk Show this past November. I found her work unique in its themes and style, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce her work to our audience. And Nancy, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, uh, let me begin by, how long have you been working as a professional artist? You mean... Making and selling? Yeah. 20. All right. No, I mean, since I was 20. Yeah, okay. So. So quite a while. Yep. And how did you come into doing <clears throat> clay as your medium of choice? Uh, I just stopped by a local clay class at my local JC, and uh, once I did that, yeah. that was the end of it. Okay. I took a year and a half uh, of ceramics, and then I just started selling my work. Yeah. That was it. And uh, in the course of, of getting into this as your medium of choice, how did you come about getting into the, the themes and the style that you've created that, and that you're doing now? Because it's an amazing, uh, unique mm -hmm. style that you have basically defined for yourself. Well, I always loved the natural world. I wasn't interested in functional pottery. I love animals and uh, nature, and I just kept looking at stuff and all of these little animals just jumped onto my work. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Well, it's a, an amazing uh, gift that you have and uh, your style is uh, extremely unique from everything that I saw at the Clay Folk Show. I mean, there was a lot of great work there, but boy, you, you are certainly got a unique style all your own. And I, in, in my mind, it makes me think uh, of mythological uh, kinds of themes to your work. Uh, and is that something that really comes to play? Is that one of your influences? Well, I was educated in classical literature. Okay. Okay. And from the time I was a little girl, I'm just, was born, you know, reading books from the time I was really little. Right. And, uh, you know, mythology and stories and symbolisms, animal totems, all of that came out of that time period in my life when I was actually in school. Yeah. But it wasn't long before I, I left school behind and I just started freelancing. I started out at the Renaissance Pleasure Fair. Somebody invited me uh, to go and sell some stuff and I made my first thousand bucks. That yeah. was it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wasn't going to do anything else. And, you know, next thing you know, 40 years went by. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that strike me among the, your themes is your, uh, the use of the raven. Uh, you, we have like a, a piece here uh, uh, on the table. And uh, uh, I, all the raven pieces that when I visited your studio several weeks ago, uh, it, my first thought that occurred to me was that Poe would be a big buyer of your work <laughs> if he was alive today because uh, boy that was just something that I thought was really cool. I see the raven as the bringer of light, the bringer of magic. Uh, the raven was the teacher uh, to the Native Americans, mm -hmm. brought fire, uh, the Inuits, you know, in uh, Alaska area, they they revere the raven. He's in many of their their totems, the big totem mm -hmm. poles. Right. Um, Poe, he's a Puritan. <laughs> Not so much a Puritan. No. But yeah, but the raven is certainly something that's associated with him. So that's the first thought that came to my mind when Very I Very famous it. man. When yeah. I was in, I went to see where he was born. Yeah. When I was back east, and he had a nice little house, <laughs> and that's where he was born. So I went to see his place. Yeah. But I only have this one raven here. The other two are, that I had are sold. One went to Montana. The other one went to Freedom, California. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah and uh, and from talking to you before, you've got quite a few foreign customers of your work too. So. 
Yeah, I do. Uh, uh, this hat is slipping. Um, uh, I've had a lot of dealers sell my work. Uh, Saudi, there's a Saudi prince who's collected a lot of my bird pieces. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I make the piece in my little studio, and next thing you know, it's in London. Yeah. You that's that's got to be an exciting thing for you, for any artist, really, to know that. It's a paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a paycheck. Yeah. You know. Well, we've got uh, a, a few images of your work uh, that we want to kind of bring up to kind of talk about some of uh, the images. Okay. So if you, the control room could bring up some of, this is like an oh. eagle piece, right, that, uh, that you've done. That piece is 20 years old. Um, I did that. I love birds of all kinds, you know, and yeah. I just, uh, that's kind of a, uh, was inspired by the painting by Audubon. Uh, it shows the full body mm -hmm. of, of the eagle uh, in his painting, but I put it on a vessel. Yeah, well, it was a beautiful piece. Let's go on to the next uh, image. And this is, uh, again, one of your raven pieces. Uh, that belongs to Mary Lee Ray. She's a cloisonne artist in California. Yeah. Um, the antler is, a re is not a real antler. That is clay. Yeah. Uh, that's a really nice raven. Yeah. I make a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Oh, uh, the pear. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful uh, uh, piece. Yeah, the pear is, it's simple, uh, difficult to make. Yeah. Really difficult to get them, the shape just right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Oh, that one. That one uh, was done as a special commission. It's a, a funer funerary urn. Oh, okay. Yes, it is. And uh, the next one? Oh, that's the five lizard bowl. Yeah. That's here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think there's another sequence in that one. Yeah, that's like a kind of top view. Very interesting piece. I've, I've made a lot of them over the years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I should have made it a limited edition, but uh, I maybe sell one or two a year. Yeah, okay. You know? uh, let's go on to the next one. That's uh, another memorial urn. Um, it's the oak motif. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, all the oaks on the ranch, symbol of longevity and right. long life yeah. and stamina. Okay. The raven, the teacher bird. Yeah. Uh, let's go on to the next. Oh, the, the pink, pink elephant. elephant. Yeah. Uh, when I uh, first made that piece, I thought, ah, you know, they come out white. I thought, yeah. oh, I'll make it pink. So I make it pink, and I think no one's ever going to buy this piece. It's a pink elephant. Who would buy the pink elephant? No sooner did I pull it from the kiln, I go back to the studio. I go up to my house, open my email. There's a woman in Florida looking for an elephant teapot, uh -huh. and I'm thinking, oh, she won't want it. It's pink. But I sent it to her. She bought it. Yeah. It, it was gone. Yeah. I mean, I had it like a week. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, let's go on to the next one. The horny toad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is a fun piece. And I sell them fairly regularly. The horny toad is endangered. Oh, okay. You know, they're companionable. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people come over and say, oh, I had one of those when I was a child. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we used to take them and, and bring them home, and and they would hang out with us, and and now they're endangered. Wow. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Oh, that one. <laughs> the raven with the corn. Yeah, that's kind of a Halloween piece. <laughs> okay, and I think the last one. Now that's a view from your uh, from your from your from porch. my porch. Yeah, I was at your uh, I was at your place several weeks ago. Uh, when I visited your studio and, and visited you, and uh, and that is a good representation. I put that in there because it's a good representation of your the environment in which you work uh, at your place. Yes, because you know, you're deep in the Applegate. Yes, and uh, and just getting up to your studio was a bit of an adventure for me because yeah. I've never been up that deep into the Applegate before. So. I I don't like leaving the ranch. I stay <laughs> well, at home. Well, I don't a lot. blame you. You got a beautiful place. So. I stay at home. If I go anywhere, I saddle up and ride out. Yeah, there you go. Um, I spend it, horseback riding is my meditation, and yeah. it always has been. So, yeah. now what's your uh, what's your typical process for designing and creating your pieces? 
I mean, do you like to do a lot of preliminary design, drawing, or is it just kind of like a free, free thought kind of free creation kind of a process? Um, I just kind of uh, think about things. I wait for things to come to me. Mm -hmm. I'm patient about that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I do, I take a few weeks off and just do other things, and then when I feel like it, I have something ready to happen. I just let it happen. Yeah. Or, like this fish piece here, mm -hmm. uh, when I first made it, I thought I was going to do a five lizard bowl. I got it. I looked at it. I'm sitting there with my tool in my hand, and I carved the fish. Yeah. Now, this, the, the, the fish itself is that's actually hand carved into the clay mm -hmm. itself that after you've created the bowl mm -hmm. form. Oh, I grew up in San Francisco, and I spent a lot of time at the museums and in Chinatown looking at the carvings. Of course, the great Chinese yeah. ceramics, mm -hmm. all of them. Right. You know, the Brundage. That was my idea of a good afternoon was to go to the Brundage when I was 14. Uh -huh. Everybody else was going to the movies. <laughs> I was going to the museum. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed in, Sad is just in looking at your work, that the acorn se seems to be a pretty common motif too in uh, among the themes that you do with your work. Well, being a native Californian, you know, the, the rolling hills, the beautiful oak trees, and of course the ranch is full of oak trees. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my very dear friends once told me, uh, you can count the acorns on the tree, but can you count the trees in the acorn? <laughs> and I always thought, uh, it's a symbol of longevity, uh, of just, there's just, they're just so beautiful. Yeah. You know, I'm, and I'm interested in the acorn in various uh, times, so what, the bud, the, the change of color, and then when they drop and then the deer come and feed on them, they're just, it's just a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I notice, you know, one of the things that strikes me in your, in your work is, the coloration that you get into your into your clay because you do a lot of pastel type of colors. Mm -hmm. uh, it the the coloration is kind of a uh, a matted pastel, but it's an extremely beautiful uh, appearance. Uh, what's the process for for getting that effect that you that you achieve in your clay? Well, let me start by saying when I was educated in college in my clay class. It was all hard glazes, mm -hmm. very Japanese, very, very so Japanese. We were so influenced by Bernard Leach and, and uh, uh, Hamada and, uh, and then the Scandinavian uh, hard glazes. But my work, that, that they've done their work in that. I wanted to break away from that and I wanted to capture color. Mm -hmm. I knew I had to go low fire. I didn't want to do Raku. I didn't want to do, uh, uh, I just, what I decided I would do is take underglazes and airbrush them in multiple coats okay. on this low fire porcelain. Okay. So it's a, a complex project. Uh, it has many steps, uh, but I love it. Yeah. And I get what I want. Yeah. And I don't need a shiny glaze over it. They are not dinnerware. Right. Yeah, so they're totally meant from the beginning to be just straight artistic pieces. Yeah. And uh, they do have some functionality. Right. But functionality, there's many there's many casserole dishes and mugs out there. This is not them. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's um, you know, it's uh, the, the just just the the coloration, how you, how they, everything just blends, and and uh, it's just a an amazing thing. It just stands out from everything else that I saw, at, like at the Clay Folk Show, and uh, well, it's a unique service treatment. Yeah, and I really trial and error, trial and error. Yeah. Well, well, I say at this point, for the years that you've got invested, that you you've got your technique down. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I, I have pretty conf every confidence in your ability to, to deliver whatever effect that you're going to try and achieve. I have a large techno muscle. <laughs> I do. Okay. And I, I'm interested in a challenge. Uh, so I'll work with the piece until I can get it. Yeah. If I can't get it, it goes back in the bucket. Yeah. That's it. <laughs>
typically, what's the length of time involved in creating a piece like this, for example, or you know, the raven with the acorn, or the 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 bowl there, or you know, your five lizard bowl. I mean, it. You know, I mean, are we talking like weeks of of development time to? Uh, to each piece, or you know, what's the what's the time frame involved? I work on more than one piece at a time. Okay. But in the studio, there's really no time. Yeah. You walk into the studio; it's a time warp. Uh, you don't. There's no hourly wage. Yeah. There's none of that. Um, I work on more than one piece at a time. Uh, I can throw a piece that's turning it on the wheel, mm -hmm. and it might take two or three days for it to dry enough for me to be able. To, to trim it and start carving it. Meanwhile, I'll work on other pieces. I like working on more than one piece at a time. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, a little here, a little here, a little here. Uh, while I was in the studio this week, I counted how many pieces I made from start to finish. In one week, I did nine. Oh, OK. All right. I did two big ravens. Um, I did a wall piece. I did two wall pieces. I lost one. That went back to uh. the bucket. <laughs> it didn't make it. Yeah. Uh, and what else did I do? I did uh, two pears, two ravens, uh, two small vases, and yeah. a couple of wall pieces. Now, how often, you mentioned one didn't make the process. I mean, what percentage of your work that, that you're working on, you know, ex we experience that where there's you know, something just isn't right with the clay or whatever it happens to, to... You mean before it's fired? Yeah. Back in there? Not very many. Okay. It's in the firing. Yeah, this, yeah <laughs> that's where the danger zone yeah. is, right? Yeah, heat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, so are, is it like, you know, 5% uh, or less of that kind of thing happens, or is it just... There are no statistics involved in yeah. my work. Yeah. It's just, uh, I do it, and if it makes it, uh, you know, I get paid by not how much I make, but how well it is right. uh, and how good it is. Yeah. If it's not good, yeah. Yeah. they make hammers for that. Yeah, right, that's right, yeah. 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 Tap them. Now, uh, how, where, where can people find your work? Are you, are you, are you, are you got representation in, in any galleries right now? Uh, right now? Uh, Scrimshaw Gallery in Sausalito, okay. Mike Attaway, he sold my work for years and years. Uh, online, artfulhome.com, uh, okay. they sell a lot of my work. Uh, I sell on Etsy, I sell at local shows, I get emails out of the blue. <laughs> Just yeah. And uh, now, because I met you at the Clay Folk Show, and I from that, I assume that you that's not the only show that you go to in the course of a year. Uh, how many shows throughout the year do you travel to? to, to I exhibit? still keep, I still do my public appearance. My probably my, I'm a longtime member of the uh, San Francisco Potters Association. Okay. Uh, it used to, well, it, it's now called the Asso California Association of Clay and Glass. It's ACGA.net. I'm an emeritus member. That means 25 plus years. Um, it's a carefully screened and juried organization, and we have an annual show at the Palo Alto Cultural Center in July. Wonderful show, great work, good customers. Yeah. You know, there's that one. The other one I really like doing is the American Craft Council in San Francisco. I've done many of their shows. Um, for, I did their Baltimore show for 20 plus years. Uh, that was just wild. I've done the Philadelphia Museum of Art show oh, wow. in the past. Mm -hmm. I've done the Smithsonian. I've done them all. I've done, <laughs> I've done many, many big shows, yeah. national. First, you have to compete to get in. Right, exactly. And yeah. then once you get there, you have to get yourself there. Yeah. Don't drive. We used to just have the mover come and take the stuff, deliver it to the booth. I would fly in, set it up, do the show, pack it in. The mover takes it out, delivers it home yeah. to my house. I'd get on the airplane and fly home. <laughs> and that was my life for about 25 or 30 years. Yeah. Then we had the economic downturn and the influx of imports. 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. 
right in there. Yeah. 9-11. Yeah. That pretty much ended a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, and then, of course, the Internet. The Internet has been, has been great because I take a picture. I've had to learn. I photograph. Yeah. I post. I sit back. I wait. I get the email. I pack it up. I ship it. And I get paid. So a big chunk of your of your sales are coming off of the internet. That's then. right. Yeah. Now, in regards to pricing, what's the general typical range of pricing? Mm -hmm. S starting with like your smallest pieces, like what we have on the table here, uh, to like the larger pieces that we have on display. What what can people expect to pay for uh, for your different styles? Oh, of pieces? 150, 120, on up to like two thousand. Right. Okay. And if they buy it from me, they'll get they'll get my price. If they buy it online, yeah, I get half of what it's listed for online. Uh -huh. So if you want something, call me up. Yeah, <laughs> call go direct to the artist. Go direct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the dealers they, and galleries they gotta have their markup too. They do, they yeah. do. And, yep. and and maintaining an online gallery, can you imagine? You know, yeah. all the the different people. But all my galleries use do online. Yeah. Mike Attaway at Scrimshaw, yeah. he does uh -huh. online. Yeah, are you? Uh, is there a local gallery that people can see your work at right now? At uh, my at the ranch. At the ranch. Yeah. Okay. And um, and what's your uh, web address right now? Oh, the, it's nancyadams.net. Net. Okay. All right. And uh, now you initially started your life in California. Yep. Uh, how long ago was it when you? when you moved to Southern Oregon? 16 years. Okay. I drove up. I wanted, I wanted to get out of the Bay Area. I couldn't stand it any longer. It was costing me too much to board my horses. I thought, i got to get a place where I'm at home, yeah. and I've got my horses at home, and I've got my studio all together. And it was just the right time. I, I, kept, I looked all over California. I just, nothing, was, nothing was what I wanted. Right. I drove up to the Applegate. I drove right to up Thompson Creek Road. Saw the for sale sign. Wrote it down, and that was that. Yeah. Exactly what I wanted. Yeah. I didn't realize what a big deal it was to have a big piece of property, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I can remember going to the nursery and and bringing home a couple of six packs, and I realized I needed to bring cases of plants and I put all that stuff in the ground and then of course the deer ate yeah. them and anyway yeah well there, there are uh, there are definitely issues involving uh, dealing with the large property so, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but it's it, you know having visited your place several weeks ago I mean it's, you've got a beautiful location that you have to find inspiration from all the nature that is around you I would imagine I do a lot of just watching the sky and and riding out on horseback I just empty my mind yeah. and go. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, if I was uh, if I was in in uh, the position too, I would I would have, love to have a place like what you got because it's a uh, it's a beautiful uh, place where you're at. It's not everybody can do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I would. Uh, and there was a time in my life when that was what I really thought would be a really wonderful thing, but then I had a couple of heart attacks, so that kind of scares me getting it out that far. It keeps me from having a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, we talk about, a little bit about uh, your uh, mythology in your, in, as among your inspiration. Um, are there specific, um, Areas of mythology because a little bit of like what I've seen at your studio and here, there's I see a little bit of tinge of like Chinese kind of art elements that come through in some of your work. So is like Chinese mythology been something too that is some of an the influence? greatest artists in the world are in Japan. Yeah, best porcelain, most beautiful bronzes. Same thing with Japan. Uh, because I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, diversity, yeah, lots of diversity. Also, Roseville pottery, American pottery. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time just wandering around at people's houses, looking at what they had. Right. You know, people collected Roseville for years, yeah. and they still do. Yeah. These beautiful pastel pieces. That's Roseville. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nancy, it's been really great having you come onto the show. 
and uh, to be able to talk about your work and your life. Uh, you've got really incredible uh, work that is just really outstanding, and I'm excited to, to see it. I'm excited to have you uh, on the show and to talk about it. So I thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, with that, we uh, have reached the end of our show, Rogue Artisans and Crafters, and we want to thank you at home for joining us and learning about our featured artist, Nancy Adams. We thank Nancy for being our featured artist and appearing on our show to discuss her life and work. We also want to thank our crew who have made it possible to put this program together and to thank RVTV for their wonderful studio facility, which allows us to produce shows such as this one. If you'd like to become a studio producer and create your own public access show, you can contact RVTV to learn how. You can watch this show on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. and Thursday evenings at 11.30 p.m. on Channel 15 of the Ashland Home Network and in the rest of Southern Oregon via Charter Cable on Channel 182. You can also find all episodes of Rogue Artisans and Crafters at archive.org. You can also visit RVTV online at rvtv.sou.edu to find live streaming of all RVTV shows. Please make sure and check out Nancy Adams' website where you can get more information about her art. I'm your host, David Glamour Dave Nino, and we will see you next time. And that's the end of that for, for this show. <laughs> <laughs>